Hello hikers, Green Giant here, one of your hosts. I'm really excited about this episode because Megan and I finally got the chance to sit down and have a conversation with someone who, quite frankly, I'm a bit of a fan of. Keith Foskett, also known as Fozzy. He's one of those guys that seems like he's done it all. Keith has hiked the AT, he's hiked the PCT, he's been on the CDT, he's hiked one of the Caminos, He's walked across Scotland, as if that's not enough. He's handsome. Keith is also a best-selling travel writer. He's got five, well, as of today, he's got six travel books out. Keith's latest, High and Low, is scheduled to be released on the same day as this episode. So if you're listening, you can get it. Keith is one of those writers who has the ability to bring you along with him, make you feel like you're really there, and has this remarkable and unusual ability to uh, describe the unpleasant parts without having to resort to complaining. It's just a real pleasure to read from start to finish. Zach Davis joins us on the call. The four of us had a really good conversation about hiking, writing, depression, dogs, maple syrup. I don't want to give away too much. You should probably listen for yourselves. This is Stories from the Trail. Someone called Zach. Nice to meet you guys. Hi, Zach. Uh, I'm Fozzy. Nice to meet you. Make your acquaintance, Fozzy. Badger on trail. Uh, Zach, are um, you at your place or are you in the co-op? I went home. Uh, the co-op closes at 5. I figured there'd be a lot of commotion. Also, uh, I've got a 11-week-old puppy that does not do well in new places, so coming home was the only choice. I think you did the right thing. Yeah. Why is everybody why is everybody getting puppies at the moment? I have a dog lying on my bed which I, I read home yesterday. It's my first day with a dog. Why is everybody oh, getting wow. dogs at the moment? How how old is the pup? Uh he's a year and four months. He's a he's a border collie. You went with a mature smart dog. You're a much smarter man than I am. <laughs> I did. I it, rehoming was definitely the option and um kind of really sort of young puppies uh weren't necessarily hard to find they were quite difficult to find but um i figure if they're at the puppy stage then that could be a bonus which so far seems to be uh seems to be the case yeah yeah uh i mean I, i've grown up with dogs and puppies as well but this is my first time being responsible for one and it's a it's a very different ball game when you're the one that has to take it out at 3 a.m every single night yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm perpetually. I feel like this is. I'm getting a taste of what actually being a parent is like. Um, I know. I'm not sure. Are there any parents on the call here? Because saying that probably makes me sound incredibly naive, if not stupid. But uh, this is, you know, not being able to just uh, selfishly enjoy my eight hours overnight, or not have to chase something around the house because it's chewing on cords was a luxury that I no longer know. Zach, my mom is going to listen to this, and if she hears that, she will be rolling her eyes very hard. That's good. Uh, <laughs> you'll know where she can direct the hate mail. <laughs> oh, she's too nice for that. Way oh, too okay. nice. She would just send you a nice little letter saying, well, I hope that if you have kids in the future that you reconsider. <laughs> or... You mean <laughs> I can't really... just lock them in a cage while I record a podcast? <laughs> uh, she probably would have done that to me, but you know, that's not okay for other people. And yeah. other children. Everyone's got their own parenting style. <laughs> Cages could be one, I guess, maybe. <laughs> no, Cage no, parents. spay and neuter your pets, your pets, not your kids. <laughs> <laughs> or just spay and neuter yourself so you don't have to worry about the kids thing. <laughs> uh, well, I should add, it's uh, the unfortunately, I haven't, um, I haven't, um, uh, needed to get up at 3am in the morning so far. He's uh, he's uh, he's slept right through both not both nights. Now I do sound like a parent, but um, yeah, he's he's gone through <laughs> any, uh, without any problem at all. He's so far he's uh, 
he's a good that's good yeah uh mine mine's locked in a cage because otherwise it'd be eating my shoes yeah fair point um megan or megan can i just ask which one is it megan or is it megan whatever you want it to be okay fantastic Wow. Great. I also have to say, Foz, you really classed up this whole act with just your accent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Um, Thank you. Accent, yeah. We're the ones with the accent, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, you are. I must admit, Gary, I, I do. If you don't kind of talk a little bit slower than you normally do, so I, I struggle with some words. Actually, I'm, I'm joking. I don't struggle with that at all. But out of all three of you you definitely sound the most american and and is that is that like a southern accent is that is that a southern accent or uh, i am from western pennsylvania and it's interesting because okay. that particular regional accent is the one that they taught for years in broadcast school to television broadcasters so is that an old wives tale because i've heard the same exact thing about people from the midwest well, I, I actually learned that at a journalism school in the Midwest. So, oh, okay. Um, well, then that's the Trump card. So what it's worth. I'll defer to you on that one. Yep. So I, I am, in a sense, the voice of America. <laughs> in the voice of reason. <laughs> if, guys, here, if I'm the voice of reason, nice we're in big trouble. Neutral American, but. <laughs> but Penn, no, Pennsylvania is like, it's kind of like halfway up, isn't it? Is it not north or south or is it halfway up? That's that's Pennsylvania? Yeah. Oh, it's kind of like, well, I mean, Gary, Gary probably should be sure. answering the question, but Gary, I'm going to answer for you. Please. Um, it's the middle of the country, kind of nowhere, like nobody really knows where it is. It has an identity of like maybe two different cities, but it's like, it's, eh, it's not New England, not Midwest, not the <laughs> South, not the North. Am that, I wrong? That's a, that's a really accurate way to put it. Yeah. Pennsylvania kind of uh, everybody at home's yelling at me right now for saying this, but the, yeah, the places you're either in Pittsburgh or Philadelphia and nobody can tell you what's in between because nobody knows. I live there I for 21 between. years. And I, I can tell know. you what's in between rocks. Yeah. <laughs> I drove through it and I can tell you there are a lot of trucks and billboards. That's what's there. Java is rolling in his grave right now, even though he's alive, uh, <laughs> because he's so upset because he's convinced that Pennsylvania is the center of the universe. <laughs> oh, boy. I kind of like Pennsylvania because, I mean, they did say uh, that it was, was flat, and I was I was looking forward to it purely from the uh, the flatness, for want of a better word, but um, I kind of enjoyed it. I remember a lot of sunshine in Pennsylvania. Um, I remember a lot of good food. I remember a lot of rides into town. I do remember the rocks, which weren't as bad as uh, everyone said they were going to be. Um, I liked it. I liked the state. I think that's the nicest thing anyone has ever said about Pennsylvania. <laughs> you can pay me later. I remember Pennsylvania was um, a lot of zero days, uh, followed by a lot of alcohol and... That's pretty much it. <laughs> You're talking about the Doyle, obviously. Um, uh, actually, it was the firehouse. The firehouse. Where was the? I don't think I even. This was heard of this the was a bar that was in an old firehouse that was locked, and you couldn't get into it unless someone, like, you knocked on the door and someone opened it up, and it looked like a firehouse door. And I came into town late one day, and I couldn't find any of my friends. Um, and I asked this woman across the street who just come out of house. And I said, Hey, I need some water. And I saw a sign saying, I can't drink the water at the little shelter thing. Where do I go? And she said, Oh, follow me. She opens up the firehouse. It looks, I think I'm going in to meet firemen who are going to give me water. And there's a bar, a full bar, pool tables. People are drinking, smoking. It's, I, I don't even, do you guys remember that? Did anybody else go there? Am I making this up? Was this an illusion? I, I, was, I was just about to ask what town that was. I, maybe that's new since I hiked. Oh, geez. I don't even remember what town. It was outside of the big Cabela's. Like, you know where the Cabela's is? Oh, yeah, right. Um, um, I, I do oh, know what you're talking about because I ate at the Pizza Hut right across from there. Uh, but I don't remember. I don't recall that bar. Had it existed or had I had it been on my radar, I would 100%. Did I just spoil something? Did I just reveal something I shouldn't have? Yeah, this is. Maybe there's the photographic that, evidence from inside this bar, bar, too. This is the ultimate trail speakeasy. 
Yeah, it really was. And I was amazed by it. Um, there is, there is actually a few photographs from inside the bar, but I don't, I don't, I don't even know if it had a name. I think it was just the firehouse. <laughs> Sounds like you stumbled into a house party. <laughs> <laughs> I, Who knows? I, I was delirious I, at that point. Yeah, Every I think you need to get more information on this bar. So I go and I can go and through hike the Appalachian Trail again, just to go into that bar. Yeah. I mean, it was a great time. We spent a few days in that town. Hmm. Were you with Lemmy? Um, I Lemmy was there. Doc was there. Uh, I have a picture. I'm trying. Bre- uh, Breakfast Club was oh, there. Oh man, Breakfast Club. I miss that guy. Tupac was there. Ninja Mike was there. There was a big the Peace Rock thing where you jump off of it into the water. You know, over by the train tracks. Come on, guys. It's, it's famous. <laughs> the only one yeah. here. It's You're so exposing us. None of us have actually hiked the AT. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I remember that vividly because that was the first time I'd ever jumped off of a high cliff into water and I didn't know what I was doing. And I landed in a seated position. <laughs> oh, by the way, not a good idea. I went to bed that night and I slept on my, my thermo rest, which is like the egg crate sort of thing. And the next day, I can't believe I didn't get a picture of this, but the next day, the whole back of my thighs had this egg crate pattern because the blood had pooled I, overnight. I remember that. I remember and that, that was the bruise that I had for at least a solid week and a half. I remember that. You should have gotten that tattooed as a, as a <laughs> memorial, dude. Yeah, this is what I did on the AT. Things <laughs> that I learned was so bad, the it's still there. It's, it's a it's a tattoo oh. made of blood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez, that wow! Was, so, so nobody remembers that town. That was no. Just, oh, geez. <laughs> I think you're making this up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really good at storytelling. I just made the whole thing up. <laughs> Fake stories from the trail. Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> wow. So ordinarily we would do like, you know, formal introductions or something, but we're just going gangbusters here and I like what's happening. Um, Are we recording? Oh, right. yeah, we're, we're always recording, Zach. Remember, anytime you are yeah. on a call with Gary, Uh-oh. you might be recorded. I, I don't yeah. remember signing the waiver, so <laughs> my lawyers are standing by right now. Uh, I see Keith is steepling his fingers and covering his face in amazement, wondering, <sighs> what have I gotten myself into? Am I, am I the only one on, on video here? Am I the only one yeah. that everyone can see? Because that's extremely yeah. unfair if that's the case. So I, I talked I to Megan... I talked to Megan on the phone earlier today. You know, we did, we actually did a little bit of prep for this. And okay. the way I explained it to her is um, if you think about it from the listener's perspective, what I want our audience to feel like is not so much that they're watching or listening to, you know, host interviewing guest. I want them to feel like they got seated at the pub next to a table full of really interesting people and they're eavesdropping on us. Well, then why so are they listening are they, to us? Why are those people turning, turning up then? <laughs> well, I was hoping Zach knew someone. <laughs> you're, you're um, I, I understand experience. that perspective. That's that's a nice way to look at it. And it was kind of, uh, I mean, even, uh, I didn't know whether you were recording or not, but so far that's exactly how it, uh, how it kind of feels. So um, that's good, I guess. Oh, good. good. So I'm going to uh, pull up a page out of Zach's playbook here and ask, what's everyone drinking tonight? <laughs> you're throwing it back i have um i have a very strong black coffee um with a teaspoon of maple syrup but the really good thing is the mug can you see that denny's yeah why can't I've i see any mug. video i've had this mug since 1999 like the diner denny's is that what it is yeah oh that's classic are there any denny's in the uk no um for you there uh, there is um, <laughs> i first came across denny's in i'm pretty sure it was um i think it was 90 no it was 96 when i went to the states and i just kind of like uh bought an old beat up honda Civic and then just drove around for about five months and kind of stumbled across denny's and, and hung around with this uh this canadian girl for a couple of weeks and the really weird thing was i got back home and I had that mug for about six years. And this, this is this is a true story. I had it for about six years. Um, 
And I got up one morning and I was making coffee as I normally do. I picked up my Denny's mug and I knocked it and it fell on the kitchen floor and the whole thing smashed. And I just remember looking down at the kitchen floor thinking, that's my Denny's mug. I just smashed it. I loved that mug. And here's the weird thing. And I repeat, this is a true story. Uh, the postman, or I guess the, the mailman, as you would say, um, uh, delivered a parcel about half an hour later. And there was a little cardboard box um, and it had uh, the postmark, the stamp was from Canada. And I recognised the writing. It was from the, uh, her name was Vicky. That's who I was hanging around with in the States. And I opened it and I swear to God, there was a brand new Denny's mug in there. And there was a little note tucked inside the Denny's mug. And it says, just in case no you break way. the No, no, uh, no yeah, way. No oh, way. How? How was yeah. that possible? Half an hour after I, I dropped that mug, it came came in the mail. Wow. The moral of that story is your postal system is so much more efficient than ours. <laughs> you have no idea how, how, how accurate they deliver the parcels when you need them over here. Wow, that's really amazing. Oh, wow. It's weird. Yeah, it's weird. It still gets me every 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 time I look at a Denny's mug, it just it just completely gets me. I have no idea how she, I, well obviously she didn't know, but the I mean, God, the timing, come on. How how would anybody how could you even like know that would happen? That's that's amazing. Just in case. Wow. Yeah, just in case. All right, here I've got a, a special... We're going to do some Foley work. Okay. <laughs> do you have a soundboard over there? Or oh, is it good. you open a beer and then a bird flew out? <laughs> so that's it. That's it. That's how we drink Guinness in America. <laughs> is it Guinness? <laughs> inside the can. <laughs> is it Guinness or have you just got to go and saw it in the corner of the room that the sound effects would be now? <laughs> no, I'm... I'm... I'm pouring a Guinness. Do you say draft or drought or how do you say it? Drought. <laughs> it looks like drought. No, we say we say draft. If I'm you're really so you draft. thirsty. <laughs> All right, so now I have to let this um, sit we, for a minute. We normally have Guinness, yeah, draft in 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 the pub. It's kind of like a you know a hand pulled pump, but it's it's pretty good from the, in the cans over here as well. The bottle the bottles is not good, but um, yeah, we'd say draft if you got it in a in a pub on pump. I I love getting it you know that way, but we have um, here we we have to settle for aluminum, sorry, aluminium cans, and in it <laughs> there's like a little like a a mini ping pong ball thing full of I think nitrous oxide or something and when you open the can it releases the pressure inside this little ball here it's I'm going to shake the can for you it's still inside the empty can and it does something have... to you know like when you get a nitrous pour it makes it really creamy and it's got that thick head on it I'm getting ready to I don't exactly I don't exactly know what it is they they do with that thing but yeah when I say it it's it's pretty good from a can over here that that's what I was referring to and yep. it has the they used to call it the widget when they first brought it out over here it's uh, it was Guinness in a can with the widget whatever the widget was but yeah that's it's it. it's had some sort of gas in it but I think it's a nitrogen gas Yeah that would make sense That sounds right Cheers. It's good to know that the term widget also means nothing in the UK because I just feel like that's the term for when you don't actually have a word for something. It's a widget. Yeah, that would that that that's that's a pretty true statement as well. Yeah, yeah, a widget is, is something that um, yeah we don't know what is what it is. I it's guess. just like a wild card noun. Yeah, if you don't know what something is, call it a widget, and you're you're pretty safe. Yeah, like a doodad. Exactly. Thingy. Yeah, thingamajig. We We're the red it. thingy. Thingamajig over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. thingamajig. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a a candy by Willy Wonka, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Could be. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you're confusing that with a what you call it. <laughs> that's it. Oh, that's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> We could talk candy for the next hour and a half. I am game. I, I also am very confident in my ability to fill 90 minutes of candy talk. I was a very fat child. You know, I know that we may want to get back on subject at some point, but since we were talking about what we're drinking and then we got into candy, I'm not actually drinking tonight. I know somehow I don't have wine in front of me, but I'm actually um, munching on some sour gummy worms, mini sour gummy worms. So that's what I'll be doing this evening. Redeemed. I struggled with the whole sour thing. Um, I think that's an American thing. It's we've only had. It I have an addiction. You do. I, I've never quite. Uh, I don't know. I 
I can kind of do one or two of them and that's, that's about it. Then I just I couldn't know. when I was younger and then even into like adolescent sour stuff, candy just never really tickled my fancy. I was more of like a chocolate, dark chocolate cake sort of person. Then I hiked yeah. the Appalachian Trail and something kicked in and all of a sudden I wanted when I hiked, I wanted sour candies all the time. Every single time I stopped for resupply, I hit up Dollar General and I had to find at least one bag of something sour. And it, well, we I don't all know, know what, we all know what through hiking does to the taste buds. <laughs> I was say, oh, yeah. Yeah. Candy is uh, irrationally pleasurable on trail, at least for me. It's the only thing that stayed with me, though. <laughs> Like I used to crave tuna and peanut butter, but now I don't eat either of those things really. But the sour stuff has really stuck with me. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. I, Fuzzy, I, would... I have a very specific candy UK question for you. Is uh, a double decker candy bar, is that still popular in England? That, that's a, a very strange question because um, I, I had an email exchange earlier on today. Um, purely, well, not purely about double deckers, but about what uh, the UK would. Uh, or oh, sorry, what the US would would recognise in in terms of candy, and what the UK wouldn't recognise. But it it, it centred on Snickers, um, uh, Mars bars, and uh, double deckers. Uh, I do know what a double decker is. In fact, it was my favourite. Um, we would say sweets. We don't say candy over here, but we will stick we'll stick with the word candy. Um, double double decker was my favourite when uh, uh, when I was growing up. Are you you familiar with what it is? I am. I, the only reason I know about it is because I, I studied abroad in London and I have not been able to find a double decker candy bar in the United States since since being there. And I got to say, it's maybe behind Snickers, my favorite candy bar of all time. I think we're being deprived here in the United States. Double deckers, uh, don't even know how to describe me. It's kind of like a crispy. Almost I like just a Googled it because I didn't know what it was. Okay. It's, so the picture like a, has crispy stuff on the bottom and the nougat yeah. on the top? Yeah, Correct. That's it. and it's covered in milk, milk chocolate, yeah. Now, it's made by Cadbury, but, you know, Canada has some Cadbury stuff. Would Canada have double-deckers, maybe? Um, that I don't know. I, I believe Cadbury was bought by an American company a couple of years ago. I might have oh. that wrong, but I'm pretty sure they sold out to... Um, uh, one of the big American American companies. So uh, you might have it. They might have it in Canada. I'm not sure. Hmm. Well, it's Zach, I was just thinking of a different way for you to import your candy. I was going to say, Megan, since you're the closest to Canada of all of us. Uh, I went they... to school in Canada, so I, oh. I have some contacts up there, and I can probably get candy shipped down here pretty quickly. <laughs> I suppose it's easier than sending you on a Postmates errand. So. Uh... Well, I, honestly, I'm a very short drive from the Canadian border. Maybe oh, okay. like four hours. Uh We'll wait. I got a lot of night left. <laughs> it's, only, it's only 1 a.m. in England, right? Uh, can you, you want to stay up for this? <laughs> yeah, it's half, half past midnight here. Yeah. If I can get hold of a double decker, I might be able to. <laughs> Keith, yours will arrive by post before the show is over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to it. <laughs> So the thing that I've been really digging about since we're talking about UK culture for a little bit, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and confess that my wife and I, Katie and I, have completely given up on, well, not given up, we've almost completely uh, expatriated our television watching. It's almost all uh, British comedies or the the great British baking show is one of the most amazing things to ever be on a screen. Uh, Peep show, the in-betweeners. Uh, what do you think about the IT crowd? Do you watch TV? Oh, the IT um, crowd is great. Sorry. Not as, no, so that's fine. Not, not as much as I used to. I mean, I I, uh, I moved back in with uh, with my parents a few years ago after I did the, uh, the PCT, mm -hmm. basically for financial reasons. So I, I kind of put my TV um, up in the attic because I had limited space in the spare bedroom. So I just kind of watch stuff on the uh, the laptop, you know, sort of Netflix and, and iPlayer on the BBC, that sort yep. of thing. Um, I don't know. What English stuff do I like? Um, uh, do you guys ever get Faulty Towers over there? Oh, I love Faulty Towers. Um, I, yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, uh, do, you, do you care if I ask how old you are? Me? Yeah. Oh, anybody. But yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, I turned uh, 50 last year. I'm about 50 and... Wow, you look months. good for 50. I do look good for 50, even if I say so myself. Do say, yeah, 30, say so. Something. Okay, because I, I, <laughs> I gonna I'm say, good as... and I look the same age, and I'll just go on record saying I'm not 50. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to be 70 in like 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the only yeah, reason I don't look a day over sixty-five. Okay. For me. <laughs> Wait, that's that's metric, right? In, yeah. in, in yeah. I'm, I don't know. Okay, so the only reason I mentioned age is because I rem- I remember watching Faulty Towers, you know, like back in the day, like uh, we got PBS would air uh, Benny Hill, Faulty Towers. Um, the Dick Cavett show and a few other things. But uh, yeah, I remember watching that and I binged it on Netflix uh, just this, this last summer. It's, that's great. It's um, John Cleese from Monty Python. I forget who yeah. plays his wife and uh, man, Manny Manuel. He's from Barcelona. Manuel, yeah. <laughs> I think Manuel was probably the, uh, the guy that made the show, to be honest. Do you remember the, I think the one memory I have, of, I haven't watched it for years, but the one memory I have of, of Forty Tales was the, uh, the sketch were in there in the uh, kitchen. Um, and it was the show with the mouse, you know, they oh, had a mouse yes. in the kitchen and they and the health find in- it, kept escaping. The health inspector and- was there. I, yeah, that's it. I, I don't think I've ever laughed as hard in my life when he, he went out into the dining room with a like a tin of crackers that you have with your cheese and he lifted the top off and this kind of little mouse head just appears out of the top of the crackers and there's like three diners looking. Um, and you, you, Obviously, you have to see it. It's, it's, a lot, it's a lot funny when you see it than, than I try and explain it. But um, And it's clearly like... Like a, like a mouse hat on someone's finger. It's like a puppet. It's not even like a real... Yeah, that's it. <laughs> that was the stupid thing about it. You looked at it and you thought, that's a fake mouse. Because obviously you can't get a real mouse to do it. But it just looked so fake. So, that was the yeah. funny thing about it. And especially the way it kind of tilted its head. It kind of looked around at the guy sitting trying to choose his crackers. That's it. Yeah, great show. Gary, I don't want to leave you hanging on the drink introduction, so oh, yeah. I'm going to blow your minds here by saying that I'm drinking a Coors Light. Uh, <laughs> I, I like to say that I'm drinking it because uh, I live in Golden, which is where it is brewed, but the truth of the matter is uh, we hosted a house party recently, and it was what was left in my refrigerator. <laughs> All right. That works. But it was probably left in my refrigerator because it's local, so ipso facto Coors Light. Ipso facto, you're being local. Exactly. Support local mom and pop shops. You hipster, you. Yeah. All right. So Ain't nothing wrong with that. I'm drinking Guinness. Zach's drinking Coors Light. Megan, you're now your gummy worms. Are you uh, purifying those in a blender and drinking them, or are you just eating them? Because you answered Megan's that probably was your answer to the drink wine. question. She's probably not eating. I I can't believe I'm not drinking wine right now, but I mean, depending on how this how's the, this goes, I can't even start. I can't even talk right now. See, I don't need any wine, but maybe I'll go get some. <laughs> You're off to a great start. <laughs> I just didn't sleep enough last night. I feel like I wouldn't be able to put words together um, coherently if I added alcohol to this mix of just sleep deprivation and gotcha. stress. And Keith yeah. is drinking black coffee because it's midnight. Well, it's midnight 30 where you are, right? It's midnight 30 and it is a mug of coffee. I'm trying to, to suck it slowly so it lasts for um, for an hour, an hour and a half. So uh, I've got kind of like a steady drip fiend of caffeine, which is just how I like it. I, I just had a question about your coffee because yeah. you said yeah. there's maple syrup in there. And that's kind yeah. of an uncommon thing to sweeten. At least I, I think it's uncommon, but I know some people who do that. Where is your maple syrup from? Um, the brand um, is Clark's. I'm not sure which country it originates from. I know it's Canadian maple syrup. As far as I know. So it's uh, real maple syrup then? Oh, it's definitely it's definitely the real stuff. I wouldn't drink the, um, uh, the stuff where they put whatever else they put. Yeah, in. high fructose corn syrup and um, caramel color and yeah, I wouldn't something drink that else. Stuff. Uh, no. I mean, there was t- two reasons uh, I sort of put maple c- syrup in my coffee. The first is actually because it tastes fantastic. And the second is because is it's a hell of a lot better than, than sugar. And we all know the sugar issues going on at the moment. So. Mm. 
I just thought it was interesting because maple syrup is very much in my region of the world. That's that's what we do. It's kind of in our blood in New I England. Love maple syrup. Absolutely. Adorable. So I was wondering where you import it from because I didn't know if there was a I don't know, does England produce maple syrup? I don't really know. Um, I'm pretty sure it doesn't, but um, you can walk in pretty much any um, reasonable sized uh, supermarket and um, you'll find maple syrup in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's a bit of digging around, but um, you can find it. I have been meaning, I've kind of touched on, it um, sounds a little bit serious doing maple syrup research, but um, <laughs> I have been meaning to... Uh, you know, just look around and get some, see which is the best tasting stuff or the decent brands or, your, you know, what's what's the best maple syrup. Do they grade it over there too? Like the stuff that's imported, is it graded properly as well? It is. It is. Oh, um, well, there you go. I'll tell you what the grade, uh, the grade um, of the stuff I use is. But, um, yeah, I, I was aware of the grading thing. And, um, and not only that, I wanted to buy it in larger sizes because it's not um, – it's not cheap, so. Well, it's not cheap over here, but you guys have to pay for it being shipped all the way over there as well. So, mm. Mm. I I imagine it's not it's not something you go in and just go. Oh, I'm just gonna get a gallon of maple syrup today. Yeah, gallon might be pushing the bank balance a bit, but interesting. I, I might happily buy a liter of the stuff. I mean, I I use it every day. I squirt it on my breakfast in the morning, and I have a, a liter, three cups of coffee with it uh, with it in as well. So, um, God bless maple syrup. Maple oh, Syrup you. Talk is a production of the Trick.co, Zach Davis, <laughs> editor in chief. Hey, I wonder if I can get any of my local maple syrup producers around here to start sponsoring us if I <laughs> Maybe we should. Yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> There's one right down the road. I mean, I could ask them. But you get down there tomorrow, Megan. <laughs> I'll make sure I get over there. Guys, I really need some maple syrup. So tell them we need, need tell them we need fifty gallons to start with at least. <laughs> imported to or exported to England, I should yeah. say. Yeah. Oh yeah, and so, all the way over to Zach too. And Gary. I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll I'll take that real stuff. We've probably got some Aunt Jemima, which I believe probably falls under that category Ooh. of fake bullshit. Ooh, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm not a I'm not a big sweets in the morning person, so uh, I, I I accept none of the responsibility for that. However, Fozzie, I do have a question. Being the only person on this call who's uh, you know in in the month of March, I'm curious what it's like in the future. Oh, that's right. I don't understand the question. You might have probably... <laughs> uh, what, a couple reasons. What, what it was kind of an inception level question too is also a horrifically bad joke. But uh it is March first where you are, is it not? Uh it is, yes. So you technically you're in the future. We're all stuck okay, here. Okay. The jokes are okay, better when well... you explain them. <laughs> 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 Where, well, where's that soundboard uh, with the, uh, the the drum slap when you need it? <laughs> Here's my. Uh, could I not? Could I not counteract that, Zach, with with asking you what it's like in the past, <laughs> in the year two thousand? <laughs> wow! <laughs> Here's a callback for you. Gary and I are storytellers. It was always the thing. It was always the thing that our factories produced in system engineering classes. Not all of our stories are good. You know, we were we built we used black boxes to produce widgets. The good news is you didn't pay a dime for this podcast. We don't charge for the show, and as of now, we don't have any advertisers. So, if you'd like to support us, right now the best way you can do it is by joining our Facebook group. Just go to Facebook, search for Stories from the Trail, and you'll find us there. What we're looking for is your input. Tell us how we're doing, give us suggestions for future episodes, maybe things we could include as segments, games, etc. Or just tell us how much we stink, because, you know, we're new at this. Maybe we do. Anyway, thanks for listening. I understand in the future Keith has a book coming out. Ooh. Ooh. I the very near book. future. Um, where did you hear that? That's top secret, Gary. Nobody's supposed to know that. <laughs> we can talk about <laughs> anything else then. That's fine too. Um <laughs>
Uh, okay, well, allow me a little bit of shame. I like a I like a blueberry uh, syrup on my pancakes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you definitely have to go export me some of that. Um, I do have a book coming out in uh, well, it's on March fifteenth, so two weeks now. Although you can pre-order now on Amazon. I, I think um, I think, but we're going to try to release this on or about the 15th so it might already be out by the time people hear this okay that's that's a fair comment if it's after the 15th of march um whether you're in the future or the past um the book will be out <laughs> it's you. called high and low and it's about a hike i did across uh scotland in 2016 uh, which was uh, around about 600 miles um and it's uh a hiking memoir and it also touches on uh, my journey with depression at the time even though i was completely so completely oblivious to the fact that i uh, uh that i had depression at the time all yeah. right i'm going to take the low-hanging fruit how did you learn that you were depressed if you were unaware before the hike um i 2016 in um april i flew out to the us to uh have a go at the cdt the continental divide trail um i got to around 550 miles um got choppered out of the new mexico wilderness to albuquerque hospital with chest pains which turned out to be pneumonia um and I remember waking up in a motel room the following morning. I was just in hospital for a day. And I remember waking up on a bed in the morning uh, in a motel and kind of digesting what had happened. And uh, the weirdest thing was uh, the fact that the doctor had said to me, you basically shouldn't be doing any strenuous activity for at least four weeks, which was basically the end of my through hike. Um in terms of it would have put me too far behind schedule and also i just couldn't afford to hang around anywhere for uh, for four weeks um it just would have ruined the budget so the strange thing was the first thing that went through my mind was that i wasn't unhappy about it i was um i wouldn't say i was happy but i i kind of accepted it very easily and almost to the point of of i remember thinking thank god that that that, that happened um, which was a really strange thing to go through my head. But um, when I came back home to the UK, I, I rested for about four weeks and then decided to do this this hike across um, Scotland. Um, but in answer to your question, Zach, about um, uh, when or how did I realise um, I was depressed, I, when I thought about the CDT afterwards, um, or at least sort of three years after as I realized that the whole of the CDT or more my time on it, which is about five weeks, um, uh, I was very unhappy. And I remember thinking that I was unhappy, but I couldn't figure out why I was unhappy. Um, my hiking was going okay. There was a, a good group of people. Um, and I kind of realized when I got back that that was the kind of the start of the depression and even walking across Scotland, I didn't realize it um, at that point either. It wasn't until I actually got back home and things deteriorated even further and eventually saw the doctor and um, uh, and he diagnosed depression. So it, it wasn't in the States and it wasn't actually in Scotland. It was it was a good sort of six months after I uh, after I returned home. Interesting. It's it's. I feel like the story of people, you know, departing from a lackluster life um, is the source of their depression and they find relief out on the trail. Um, this is the first instance where I've heard someone, you know, uh, it, it sounded like you had it professionally diagnosed, but you also had somewhat of a self-diagnosis out on the trail that you realized that something was askew. Is this, um, and if I'm, if we're digging too deep or if I'm digging too deep, uh, feel free to just tell me to shut the fuck up. Uh, but was this something back in your home life or was um, it related to something else? And I'm, I'm curious. Um, I don't know what, what caused it. And in my, in my sort of journey um, uh, and the research I did, 
I, I, there's a there's a lot of different opinions and a lot of different views, but but generally, what I picked up on was they 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 don't really know what causes it. Um, some people will say you know it's it might be a, a mix of factors like bereavement or uh, not being happy at work. Um, but from from what I from what I gathered, they can't. There's no really sort of specific reasons. They're, they're still very unclear on it. So I can't sort of any I can't pinpoint any anything major in my life that would uh would sort of put me down that that that, that path of um of depression so i don't know i just it, it was funny i remember being i remember being the way i try to explain it is i remember being depressed um in the us and i remember being depressed in scotland but i was completely unaware that i was suffering from from depression they're two very different things you can be sad you can be unhappy and um you really don't know what's going on with with with, uh, with your life um and it, it takes quite it takes quite a while to to sort of realize that there's something wrong you know if we, if we have a few bad days and we're a little bit down we just think we're just having a bad day or we are just a little bit down but if it goes on for long periods and it, it, it gets it gets quite severe and even at that point, I, I still didn't realise until a friend said, you need to get yourself down to the doctor, something's not right. Um, um, and that was when I, that's when I, I, I got the diagnosis. So the, the, there is a distinct difference. You can um, feel depressed or down, but sometimes uh, if you are actually suffering depression, you can be completely oblivious to it. It's, um, it's, it's kind of a strange one to, to try and describe, really. Hmm. that's not an uncommon thing either um just in general for for depression i mean from what i know from my own personal experience and from my own research and my own education it's not uncommon for people to be depressed and um to be suffering from depression and not know it and not realize it people just kind of assume that their experiences are their experiences and they're normal and that there's you know part of depression is a, a feeling of powerlessness and not being able to do anything about it or not feeling like you have control over your situation or not understanding it. And that can lead to not really recognizing it and just thinking, oh, I'm just going to keep on doing what I do. So it's, it's a completely human experience, really. It's a common, yeah. it's, it's, it's not uncommon for people to go undiagnosed for years and years and years and years. So yeah, I think it's, um, I think at least three of us have uh, shared that as a common experience. Megan and I talked about it on the trail. I haven't really brought it up on the show before, but I experienced, I, I know what depression is like. I, I don't know if you say one has depression or one had depression or gets depression, but for me, it hasn't been around for a really long time. But um, I can relate to a lot of what you describe in your book. Um, Zach, if you don't mind, uh are you are you in the club? Uh, I mean, in the club of anxiety counts too. Like any, like you're one of the. Yeah, no, I mean, many... most certainly. I, it, it, the uh, the period of time after the AT was definitely the the darkest time of my entire life, and you know, I I went through a somewhat dark phase before the AT. That's that's what ultimately pushed me onto the AT, and I'm very grateful for it. Um, however, you know. Uh, I was battling some pretty severe health issues after the trail. And, you know, I, if I'm looking at it objectively, I think that depression was more so of a symptom of what I was dealing with as opposed to the cause itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were days where I didn't get out of bed, uh, just very down on life. It certainly was um, probably the most challenging period of my entire life. The bad thing is um, uh, not being able to uh, get out of bed in the morning is um, is, is quite a common. Uh, I don't know if symptoms the right word, but um, uh, I, I had no real problems getting out of bed in the morning. But I found I, I often I'd, I'd get to the afternoon and I was so down that the only way to escape it is is just to fall asleep. Um, you know, if you're asleep, you don't have to mm -hmm. exist. Have to sort of face. Was that the pup? Um, <laughs> you guys can hear that. <laughs> you, don't, you don't have to face any of this. It's this about to get a lot. So to, to sleep was, 
uh, I don't know, it was an escape, I suppose. But a lot of people, um, a lot of people, with depression struggle to get up uh, out of bed in the morning. It's not, uh, it's not uncommon. And and on those days when you're not necessarily tired or sleepy, uh, turning to chemicals or alcohol or other things is a very common, uh, you know, short term way out as well. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I. I kind of, I don't think self-destructed is a too strong, I wouldn't, you know, it was probably too strong an explanation for it, but I, um, um, yeah, I turned to, I turned to alcohol, I, I, I turned to weed, I turned to really poor um, food choices, um, I turned to not doing any exercise, um, I just kind of left, let, let go really, I, I, I don't know, I still don't know why. Um, it was almost kind of a feeling of, well, it can't get any worse. Um, I know drinking's bad for you. I know smoking weed is bad for you. I know, I know eating pizza is bad for you every night. But, you know, it gives you sort of, I don't know, three, four, five hours in the evening where, you know, you're not being kind to your body. But the the alcohol, I suppose, uh, eases your feelings a little bit for a few short hours you feel a little bit better uh, till you wake up in the morning and have to deal with the the repercussions but yeah i sought um I sought listen to a lot of stuff that I, I shouldn't have done a lot of what you're saying is in the is in the book which i finished this morning by the way and um there was a lot in it that you know i could really really relate to a lot of things that just sounded super familiar and you did it. I think you did a great job of describing, um, you know, what it feels like to, you know, to be in that state. Now, Keith's book is not just about depression. I, you know, I, I finished it this morning and I would say that it's, it's a book about, a, it's a book about a person. It's a book about a place and it's a book about a thing. So, you know, it's about Keith and the hike that he goes on in this book is just amazing and beautiful. And he has these incredible experiences. But like he said, it's underpinned with this tone of I'm sad and I can't figure out why. And without being too heavy handed, he weaves that theme into the book and still like still you manage to still feel good about what he's doing. I guess what I'm trying to say is the book's not depressing, even though it's partly about depression. I hope that makes sense. It does make sense. It was, uh, to be honest, like when I first started writing, writing it, I, it was just going to be, um, you know, my sort of usual writing style about a um, about a through hike. And it wasn't until about the second chapter that I, I thought maybe you could weave the, the depression thing into it. And I, I, I sort of struggled with it because it's obviously it's quite a personal thing to open up to, and especially to to, to put into a book where it were other people are going to read you know a lot of personal stuff but um yeah it's well hopefully hopefully it's it's worked i don't, I don't know like i said it's uh it, it's two things in one book but um i think i might have pulled it off we'll have to wait and see <laughs> <laughs> yeah there were um i i took notes um i i uh, highlighted a lot of passages and there were some things that really stood out to me um one of them was how you you um you, okay, so let's th let's back up a little bit. So you've got a you've got a a lot of books. This is what's number six for you. Uh, yeah, but one of those is a trilogy of of, of my first okay. three books. So theory five. Which one is the book where you talk about drama mania? That is the. That's um, uh, balancing on blue, which is about my Appalachian hike in two thousand and twelve. Okay. So in, in the, uh, I think the back cover notes for that, you define drama mania uh, as, you know, kind of the inexplicable desire to keep moving and seeing new things, you know, that kind of restlessness or wanderlust that all we hikers feel. Is that correct? Yeah, I think the, I actually when I don't, I can't even remember how, how I stumbled across drama mania, but I, I do remember Googling it and there was, there was a very few results coming back. Nobody seemed to know what it meant, but um I, th I think it's basically an insatiable urge to to travel or to journey, um, mm -hmm. uh, and not just. Uh, I'm not talking about um, you know a few weeks here and there. I'm talking about you know a real, almost like an addiction to uh, to travel. Um, and 
yeah, it's... I'm glad you phrased it as such, because I was going to make the connection there, loose though it may be, the addiction to hiking and then possibly you know, the addiction to substances or the chasing of that short term, you know, they say hikers have that long distance hikers have that permagrin because their brains are constantly dumping endorphins, you know, and when you're off trail, (laughs) you don't get that. And then, you know, that's why you people overeat or they turn to drugs after the trail or get depressed or am I just talking out of my ass? I don't know. Probably. Okay. I do that a lot. <laughs> no, Gary, you're definitely spot on. Uh, I, I haven't heard, you know, the explanation for the post-trail depression, like clinically diagnosed or dissected, I should say, but I agree with you in that assessment. At least based on personal experience, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, more so from this most recent through hike, like I said, after my first through hike, I was dealing with health issues, which I think, uh, kind of muddied the waters in terms of what I was experiencing, but, uh, also not just personal experience, but like, I'm very tied to through hikers through the website. So I, Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm connected to that, uh, cultural element too. Zach, you take a lot of surveys too. You, you gather data at your site. You don't just tell stories. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, like I said, I've been in, I'm not, I'm not the most quantitative person. Uh, fortunately we, we have writers on the team who are much better at that than I am, but m- m- more of my experiences, anecdotal, just like the emails that I receive and the correspondence I have with our bloggers. And yeah, it's, it is perpetual, but like, it's also not surprising whatsoever to go from getting exercise and, you know, having a community and getting healthy doses of vitamin D. You just combine all those elements to absolutely just like ripping the carpet out from underneath you. Um, It's not too much of a surprise that, you know, people struggle after the trail. Zach, you're, you're, I mean, you've, you've done two books, um, Appalachian, collection trials and Pacific Crest trials. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Um, so these are both about um, the psychology of the trail. Is that, is that right? Um, the psychology of hiking the trail. Yeah. Okay. What, what, what was the reason for sort of writing a book about those? Is that, is that like a personal thing or is it just, uh, just something you picked up from other people? Is, is it a personal journey or? Uh, it was something that I kind of fell backwards into I, after the trail. I knew that I wanted to write a book largely just to, uh, occupy my time. So I didn't have to get a job. Um, and the best place to start was to look at my personal blog and kind of see if I could draw a theme. And, uh, it didn't take very long to realize that I had a very consistent theme amongst all my blog posts was not only the personal transformation that I went through, but also what I witnessed in the hikers around me, like, I I have a horrible recall for the name of a like a mountain peak or a water source, the town that I'm in. Sometimes I don't even know what state I'm in. Like I, those are just details that totally escape me. But the thing that I'm tuned into is I think you know the uh, emotional and psychological elements, especially how they change over the course of a through hike. So um, yeah, I mean it. it I'll, a lot of the book was based on my personal experience and my transformation, but it was also a lot of what I witnessed around me. And not only those who finished, but I was curious about what separated the people from that, what separated the, those that finished from those that got off the trail. It's a, it's an interesting one that this is, uh, I guess it's, we, we do discuss it, discuss it, but um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of uh, emotional and psychological aspects for, uh, that the go through you have before you even before you even get on trail there's there's, there's a hell of a lot that goes on around in your head um um when you are actually on the trail and there's the, there's a lot of stuff to deal with when you get on on the trail as well um for me the the amazing thing um one of the amazing things about through hiking was just the amount of headspace i got um when i'm uh, I, I don't know when I'm back at home working or whatever. <clears throat> I struggle. Um, I struggle with headspace, getting getting enough time to think. I mean, I do sort of meditation to to sort of clear my head and uh, and have sort of just just sort of clear the cut the, the the clutter and stop the noise. But um, out on trail, uh, it's like my head had 
this just this huge vacation where I could just think about stuff um, that I never got a chance to think about. I mean, I, I touched on it on um, my Appalachian Trail book, and I, I remember thinking about um, things as simple as, as as the rain for like hours on end, and never getting tired of of thinking about them, and and not having those thoughts interrupted because I thought should be thinking about something else like what I should be doing at work or what am I having for dinner or um do I need to get the car service that sort of thing so to have all of this um this spare time in my head and have the ability to just really go into depth on on certain subjects I just found uh I just found um fascinating amazing yeah yeah it I think that's one of the most valuable aspects of a through hike is that it's forced boredom, which is something that's becoming increasingly harder to find in our time, like especially with a smartphone. And I'm every bit as guilty of this. This is, I think, part of the reason I like backpacking is it forces me away from my own bad habits. Um, but, you know, there, there's as fuzzy as you were saying, there's there's a lot of value to be found in boredom and just letting your mind wander and, you know, exploring thoughts and uh, confronting issues, etc. Whereas you've got, you know, a smartphone at your disposal, which is an infinite universe of information and entertainment. It's just so easy to be distracted. And I think uh, it's too easy to let yourself do that all day, every day. I'd like to hear Megan's thoughts on this. I completely agree. I was just thinking about how to word this because um, what both of you just touched upon the headspace and um, forced boredom, I think are the reasons that I went onto the trail um, being someone who described herself as someone who was carrying the burden of a mental illness and then walked off the trail saying, I don't have this anymore. This isn't a part of my life. I I'm free of it. I think that that, that piece is what um, forced something within me to change and um, allowed me to, I guess, essentially, I don't know if it's more of a accepting myself or being comfortable with myself, being comfortable with my own thoughts um, that allowed me to leave the trail. And yes, I struggled when I got right off the trail. You know, I, I did go through the whole phase of having some unemployment and having um, some stress about that, but I, I didn't plunge into a clinical type of depression, which I honestly expected of myself. And since that time, I have not, I've dealt with so much more in my life that I would think, I would assume would put me into um what I had before, what uh, some sort of negative headspace, whether that be depression or some type of anxiety or anything like that. And I think the headspace and the breathing room my brain got, if you will, when I was on the trail is what allowed me to move past it. So were there lessons learned on the trail or maybe habits that you carried over from the trail? Or is it just that you had the I, time to? I don't know. I, I don't see that there are any real habits. I mean, I've kind of, um, I, I have some of those really bad habits with the smartphone and with the staying up late, you know, things that carried over from when I was in university that contributed to um, a pre, pretty negative um, sort of outlook on life at the time. Um, so so there are some of those aspects that still exist in my life. And there's there was no like, aha moment or click or, oh, I need to do this more or that, or I need to stop doing X. Um, and then I'll, you know, oh, look, magical, everything's cured. I think it was more of um, grounding myself, gaining perspective and um, understanding myself better. I think it really comes down to allowing my brain to just do what it wanted to do and think about everything. And part of that was thinking about myself and what I wanted in the world. And I didn't, I didn't, you know, I was hoping to leave the trail going, Oh, I know exactly what I want to do in my career. I left knowing, I don't know what I want to do, but I know what I don't want to do. And I did have some of those type of moments, but there wasn't like a big revelation. It was like, Oh, this is it. So I think it was just a perfect storm of events that happened for me. Interesting. Well, that I, I hope that breeds hope into anyone listening to this who's considering a through hike because I and Megan, I don't think your story is all that uncommon. Oh, definitely not. There were so many people who I met out there who were looking for something 
to change their, their life. Something, something where, you know, something in their life was not going well and they didn't like it and they were looking for the hike to change it. I, I would caution against um, assuming that a through hike is going to um, fix whatever problem you're dealing with, but I would highly encourage anybody to have hope that um, with the right mindset. And uh, I think maybe not the right mindset, but with the openness of being out there and, being open to what your own thoughts are and what happens out there, you might gain a little bit of perspective that will help you cope and deal with things that come up in your life. I don't think it's going to solve any problems or, you know, make a decision for you, but I think it can certainly help people gain perspective on, um, you know, decisions that they've been struggling with or um, thoughts that they've been struggling with, that sort of thing. This is, this is a really good point. I think that um, Megan, you've touched on something that's, um, that's really true. A lot of people, I mean, I was, uh, I was guilty of doing exactly the same thing. Um, a lot of times, um, ever since I sort of started first doing long distance through hiking, which is sort of the early sort of 2000 to 2003. And I, I didn't consider it running away. I mean, I generally went through hiking because a, I I love the outdoors and there was nothing I could think of that I'd much rather be doing than just literally sort of walking several hundred miles and just, just seeing what happens is the whole thing was just random and it just appealed to me. I don't know what it was, but I do remember thinking on each of those trips that um, it, I'd come back a changed person and, and these trips that were going to be some sort of miraculous life changing um event and I, i'd come back home and everything would be clear and you know my why i'm here on this planet would would suddenly become obvious and what i needed to do and uh, I'm, I'm probably as guilty as that as, as anybody else and it you know sometimes it does happen sometimes people do come back and things do not say miraculous things happen but but major events do happen but generally it's uh i think it's a uh, through hiking and these 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 adventures these escapes for for several months or whatever just give us the i don't know if pieces and peace of mind is the right word but you don't make the changes when you're out on the hike but when you come back you you sort of put yourself in a position where um i guess you you feel like you have the courage to to make those decisions to make those changes yeah that's a job or doing something you really wanted to do for years and you've never had the courage to make the step to do it. You do come back from these adventures and think, you know what, stuff it. I'm actually going to do that now. I've, I've been, uh, I've been dilly dallying around with it for years and you come back and you do make, you do, you do make those decisions. So a, a through hike as such isn't, 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 a life changing event as such, but it does, you do get back and, and, and realize it, it does give you the courage to, to do these things. It's empowering. It, yeah. th the trail doesn't, it, it's not going to change your life, but it will help you realize that you can. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly. One of my favorite metaphors that I use in uh, like on a daily basis when I just, you know, even at work talking about um, learning new things, I, I like to use a metaphor of tools in the toolbox um, and I think life is all about just making sure you have the right tools in the toolbox. And if you don't, you have to go and get them. And I think through hiking is one of those things where, you know, if you go in expecting to have, you know, find all the answers and it's going to be like, um, going through a car wash. And when I come out on the other end, everything's clean. Um, you might have a bad time, um, or you might not get out of it what you, uh, expected, but if you think of it going into it, like, oh, I'm, I'm here for a learning experience. I have some things I need to deal with. I don't have the tools in my toolbox to do it right now. The through hike might provide you with some of those tools and they might help you figure out like, okay, how am I going to tackle this problem on the other end? Um, but I don't think it's a, a magical cure all for anything, but the tools in the toolbox um, metaphor is one of my favorite ones because that anytime I don't know, I just like to say, well, I don't have that tool in my toolbox and I got to go figure out how to get it. You've been to corporate managerial training recently, haven't you? <laughs> I have not been, but when I submit my application for the next job, I will. Um, can I quote you on that? Like, <laughs> she sounds, she my, sounds like she knows what she's talking about. Yeah, you, you need to work. You need that toolbox and energy thing. That's good. 
So I'm I'm actually curious. Can you guys put a finger on what tools in the toolbox the a through hike gave to you? I can. Uh, yeah, you want to go, Megan? Or uh, Gary? Gary, yeah, you go first. Yeah, Gary, I'd love to hear yours. Um. So, um, people ask, uh, you know, they ask me a lot, "What's your favorite place on the trail?" And my answer is always a log or a rock. And it's because just a random log or a rock. It's not the, you know, the peak of Mount whatever or the view from whatever pass. It's always just like a place where I can sit and be still. And never in my life before, not just the long hike, but before I started hiking, I never really experienced stillness before. I'm hyperactive. I have anxiety. I have a little bit of ADD. I'm kind of all over the place. Um, um, But you know, when I'm out among trees and bugs and birds and trickling water or even just silence, um, I don't get that in my daily life. And that that's a tool that um, that has helped me kind of stay sane for a while um, in, in that I, I've learned how to duplicate that feeling when I can't do it in the place where I learned how to do it, if that makes sense. I, I studied in the dojo and now I'm taking it onto the streets. Interesting. So, um, you know, getting that space and finding that serenity on trail it has, how has that translated to your everyday life? You just are now aware of the fact that you can achieve that level of peace and you now seek, seek it's, it or it's given me, what you're saying. Yeah. It's given me a way to combat one of the, it, it's a key to remove one of the shackles that I drag behind me. Um, my anxiety has paralyzed me before it's prevented me from, you know, taking on new projects or moving ahead with things that might, you know, be risky or, you know, not even just career things, but, you know, do I really want to try this or, you know, and if I, if I can achieve that stillness and gain perspective on what's really important, um, you know, it's, it's, it's given me the ability to make decisions less, less rashly, I suppose you could say. It's helped beautifully calm, said. It's calmed me down. Very beautifully said. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, Fazi, I believe you were going to give your tool until Gary rudely cut you off. <laughs> he, he did. He did cut me off. <laughs> um, although I'd say his answer is probably better. Um, I think, I mean, I touched on the, the headspace thing. It gave me this... Um, this clarity in my head and the ability to think about um, um, stuff really deeply. But um, I think it gave me something when I got back um, home afterwards was, um, for want of a better word, was probably courage. Um, Gary touched on anxiety and sort of making decisions. And um, I don't think I've ever been... uh, sort of suffered from anxiety when I've made the decisions my my issues was was procrastination I I, I used to roll things um if I was trying to decide to do a certain thing I'd I'd roll the uh, the facts and and everything around in my head for <clears throat> for days sometimes weeks sometimes months um and I think it was a lot of it was down to to overanalyzing it in my head and not going with what my heart's heart was uh, was wanting to know. I know that sounds really corny, but um, you know you can analyze stuff as really in depth um, in your head, and your head will always give you a logical answer. It'd just be like you know if you're a hundred dollars overdrawn in your bank, you need to put a hundred and one dollars in to get back in in, in credit. Um, and your heart might say, you know, it's only a hundred dollars. You're only a hundred dollars uh, overdrawn. You might get a nasty letter from the bank, but um, don't worry about it. And I think when when I came back off the trail, is <sighs> all this procrastination and inability to make decisions. I, I, I kind of finally figured out because I was overanalyzing it too much and not listening to to my heart. Just that I don't know that feeling you get in your chest when you know something makes absolutely no sense at all it seems completely logical but you just know it's right and i kind of that's that's one of the the realizations i got uh when i got back off the trail just to listen to my heart more also very well said thank you bravo 
I think uh, that kind of speaks to a, a self-confidence, like a, a renewed sense of self-confidence. Yeah, there was, yeah, I was, I'm a lot confident now, or I have been a lot confident the past few years than I was when, um, when I was growing up. Why? I, I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, maybe... I don't know. Maybe the trail helped with that, 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 that as well. I, I, I don't know. But can we can we um, talk about that for a second about confidence specifically? Confidence? Yeah. In sure. in your yeah. in your new book, Keith, you described yourself as an introvert. You said that yeah. uh, at a party, you're most likely to be hanging out in the kitchen. Is that still the case? Uh, no, I'm now in the cupboard in the kitchen. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> um. <clears throat> I guess yeah, you'd probably still find me in the kitchen, but I'm I'm not as introverted as I used to be. Um, uh, I used to be really introverted, and um, uh, when I was going through the depression stage, which was 2016, 2017, um, uh, I don't know if it, introverted is probably a kind word. I think withdrawn is probably um, is more sort of appropriate. Yeah. I didn't really want to see anyone for long periods of time and I didn't go to social events or you know sometimes at days I didn't even go out but um but that's just I think that's just a, it's a side effect of the depression but my I don't know my introvert being introvert I like being introvert I accept it now I'm probably not as introvert as I used to be but um introvert's a good thing I like being introvert it's it's curious that um, I guess a lot of people who don't know writers personally have a hard time imagining us as being introverted because, you know, our primary means of communication is to, like, let's tell this to as many people as we possibly can. But what they forget is that we do this, like, in a room with the door closed for months. <laughs> right? Yeah. Writing is our is our way of communicating. You know, some people like to hold a party for five hundred people to get the word out. We just like to put it down on, you know, in a book. It's just our way of doing it. Do you mind if I ask you a couple of writing related questions? I I would be remiss to have this many Amazon bestsellers on the line at once and not talk a bit about the craft and the business. Sure. Mind if we give a few minutes to that? I'm I'm curious to know about your process. Your uh, your trail descriptions are very, uh, very detailed, not just the scenery, but the people you met and the conversations that you had. And it, it you either have a photographic memory or you're recording your entire hikes or something. You're, you know, what's, how, what's your process? Um, it's a mix. I mean, my main, uh, my main method of recall is uh, my diary. So, okay, let's take a, an average day on, on, on a hike. Um, those thoughts popping into my head left, right and centre, as I'm sure we're all aware, a lot of them I dismiss. But if there's something I think that's relevant to the book, then um, I'll, dictate, I'll dictate that verbally into my, uh, into my phone. So at the end of the day, I might have sort of 10, 15, 20, 25, 5, 10 second clips about what I was thinking at that particular time or what I was seeing or what I was doing, something I, that might be funny or amusing. Um, I took pictures as well, um, obviously. Um, so that was that was my recall method, and I did some conversations. I did recall, especially when um, I was on the Pacific Crest Trail. I don't know why that was. I used to recall conversations there more than anywhere. I don't know, but uh, sometimes you just get a sense of a conversation coming up, or you you're you're in. The company of someone interesting and um and i didn't sort of do it discreetly or anything sometimes i blatantly you know put a phone on the table and said oh do you mind if i recalled this um mm. and they're like invariably okay. people would say no problem um a lot of it i didn't use some of it i did and if there was conversations which i hadn't recorded i mean some of it was from from memory and i and my memory isn't great but um you know it wasn't the readers don't know your memory is not that great for, the, um, <laughs> for all of us reading your book is the first time we're seeing um, this guy. Sure, his hair was blue. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess it was mainly the diary, I suppose. That was my a lot of my thoughts went down into my diary. So that that's that's where I usually got my uh, the bulk of my ideas for the for the books from. How much time do you spend 
uh, converting that into a manuscript? Um, my my books have all seemed to follow a, a similar pattern in that in that I get back from a height and I usually write half of them uh, within about three or four months and then I usually leave them for two years. Okay, you're, they say <laughs> and, you're supposed to do that, why, and it, it gets to the point where. I'm like, okay, I need to get this book out. And I have a mad rush and I, I, I allocate eight months and do a detailed writing plan, which again never happens. And usually I get <laughs> two months before it's supposed to be written and I sort of bash everything out in, in two months to get it finished. So, um, And you work with an editor? Yeah, his name's, uh, my editor's name's Alex Roddy from a company called um, Pinnacle Editorial in the UK. Um, so I write it. Um, Alex, uh, does a first edit, um, the usual stuff, spelling mistakes, grammar, punctuation, that sort of thing, cleans it up. And then I put it out to, uh, what I call my street team, which is a group of about a hundred, 150 people who read that manuscript. And they then get back to me with any mistakes they've picked up. Um, Alex then corrects those. And then I know a wonderful woman in the States called uh, Wendy Werneth, um, who does a final proofread. And she's amazing because she picks up on all the little ind- idiosyncrasies between the UK and the US mm-hmm. uh, English, for example. We say head torch, which means absolutely nothing to a lot of Americans. But if I said headlamp, you know exactly what I was talking about. Right. So she picks up on all those little words that and tries to suggest words which we could uh, we, we can understand both sides of the Atlantic. And you are a self-publisher, right? You're the publisher as well. Um, I'm not a publisher as such, but yeah, I mean, I self-publish. Um, you know, I, I do pretty much everything. There's a few people I use to do, you know, like book design and formatting and editing, which we've just, mm-hmm. just talked about. But oh. yeah, essentially everything's sort of down to me. Yeah, I just do it all through uh all the books are on, on, on amazon that's 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 where they're all for sale that's if you want to use the word publisher then i guess amazon sure. would be um the publisher i suppose yes have you ever experienced somebody uh, kind of balking at the fact that you're a self-published author you know when they've never heard of you before and you're talking about your books and kind of tend to turn their nose up a little bit and they think oh self-published oh this is a little self-indulgent garbage or something but um i've had that reaction a bit before i've had uh, uh bookstore owners say no we don't carry self-published books in exactly that tone you ever run into that yeah um I not so much nowadays, actually, but I did. I get it occasionally. And I think there is still this misconception that in in order to produce a great book, you need to go through a publishing company, which, to be honest, is just rubbish. Um, There's I mean, you've only got to look at um, uh, Stephen King, for example, self-publishes now. Um, There's so much to be said for self-publishing. When I first, uh, the first book I wrote um, in 2010, I remember uh, sending it off, I think, to about 25 publishing companies. And I think I had about four replies, uh, pretty much stock responses of, of, no, sorry, you know, we don't see a a gap in the market for this sort of book. Um, Very generic responses. And it was quite a a despondent um, uh, experience for me you know I'd, I'd spent a lot of time writing this book and uh suddenly it felt like I wasn't going to go anywhere and the woman that was editing that book at the time suggested self-publishing now this was back in as I say 2010 and uh, I don't even think Kindle was in really in its infancy and self-publishing I, I hadn't even heard of it and, mm-hmm. and pretty much uh, everybody that I knew hadn't heard of it either but um that's when I first first sort of got into it and I think it's I don't know the I think traditional publishing is um I don't know if it, if it's if it's going to last much longer if that's that's the right expression to use but you know for for years a lot of publishers have been in the hands of the the big publishing um companies and it's it's 
I think something like 99.9% of applications get uh, rejected. So it is a disheartening experience. And now we have this avenue to put our work out there. And it's, it's not a question of whether you're going to be rejected or not. If you want to do it, you can do it. And there's some fantastic stuff out there. Yeah. And this well, stigma it, of of being self-published is, uh, or you you produced an inferior work because you're self-published. I, I don't think there's any truth in it at all. No. I think between self-publishing, um, you know, YouTube celebrities, and uh, hmm. you know, like SoundCloud musicians, I think all of our big, you know, big three means of media consumption are now starting to come from you know it's audience sourced now we're entertaining ourselves we don't need you know a board of executives to tell us what to laugh at anymore yeah only the strong survive but i mean to flip that on its head think about how many you know youtube personalities or soundcloud artists that don't make the cut and i think that feeds into the perception of why self published authors don't get the respect that uh, authors going through, you know, the traditional routes uh, are getting, which I think is fair. But to, to Fozzie's point, um, the perception that you have to go through a traditional publisher to to write a great book is just is just not correct whatsoever. Um, that, and there's two people on this hangout and me that can attest to that. Were you was that always your choice to go self publish from the start, Zach? Um, to be honest with you, I, I didn't have huge expectations for my book really at any point. Um, not in terms of the, the quality of the content. I always put 150% into it. I just didn't, it, it didn't like, I was writing for such a niche topic and, right. you know, I had a little bit of a following through my personal website. I thought some of those people might buy the book and I thought that's where it would end. So I, the idea of pursuing traditional publishing just didn't make sense to me because I didn't see a real ceiling for it um that and i saw it as an educational opportunity like i figured if i was going to write a book that not many people were going to read at least i wanted to take away the process of learning how self-publishing works from that um i apologize if you can hear dogs barking in the background this is my life now i live in a zoo well we like dogs uh, barking. it's adorable <laughs> i'm jealous yeah uh, but that, that ends. Um, so my mom is a published author. She went through Simon Schuster, like a best selling author. She's, she's very good at what she does. Uh, but through her experience, I learned that, you know, they put a lot of the onus on her in terms of marketing. They handle everything else, the cover design, the editing, obviously the formatting, et cetera. But uh, she's in charge of the majority of the marketing, and then she gets paid a big upfront contract based on the success of her previous book. But she doesn't make any money based on the success of the book until after it sold an insane amount of copies. Yeah. So um, I saw that, you know, in the small percent of probability that I actually ended up selling a lot of books, I wanted to actually reap those benefits. Um, which I think is why self-publishing is probably attractive to the three of us: is you actually get paid for your hard work as opposed to getting some nominal contract from some independent publisher that, and then they make all the money on your hard work. Yeah. I can't, I can't add to that. That's, that's very, that's apt. And especially, you know, it's your thing to build your own platform. Uh, Gary, you've done a good job of that yourself. Uh, Fozzie, I imagine you've got a huge following with all the books that you've written. Like, it's just the this is the 21st century it's that there's a new way of doing things and if you know there are youtube celebrities that get more eyeballs than the people that go on to jimmy fallon's show or like the the traditional avenues are just they pale in comparison to the internet fame so to speak yeah it's um all of these these these, these artistic pastimes whether you're um you're vlogging you're writing or doing music or or whatever it's it's i think the last few years it's all been uh, uh it's all been turned on its head really how we used to do things um you know we needed these uh, these big companies to to get our stuff out there if you were a uh, if you're a singer or you're with a band you know you'd, you'd go to the big companies and ask for a record deal and then invariably you walk out being disappointed if you're a writer you go to the big publishing help companies and the chances are they'd never even read the manuscript you've you've, you've sent them, um, and it's great now. It's not only can we can we get all this stuff out there, but we have 
pretty much full control over it. You know, we get to say what what goes on the cover of our books. We get to say what the book's actually called. Um, we get to dictate how many words go into it. We we get to dictate how we market it, when we market it, where we market it, how much price it is, sorry, how, much, how much the book costs. Um, um, so, yeah, it's every, everything's been turned around, and it's 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 obviously for the better. It's um, but it's a lot of work too. I mean, it's you're one it's essentially a, a one person yeah. show. Yeah, and there, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what your guys' process was for finding uh, like a book cover designer or someone to format your books or edit, but you assume a lot more of the risk, i.e. the overhead cost, as opposed to going the traditional publishing route. So, I mean, it's definitely a risk reward thing, mm -hmm. um, but if you're confident in your abilities, that's those are dice worth throwing. It's. A, I think it's a. You, you you tend to learn as you go along, and I think when you do too, tend tend to start. You you tend to do uh, do a lot of stuff by yourself. Like the first few books, I um, I mean, I designed the cover, and when I look back at them now, they they just look bloody terrible. But, um, <laughs> you know, the, the the further you go along through it, you it, it is a learning curve, and you. I can look at covers now and think, no, that's that's not right. And and more importantly, I get someone to do the covers now who, who knows exactly what they're doing. I'm not a cover designer, but if I can afford to pay somebody money to design that cover who does it for a living, um, all the more better. One of the things Fozzie does really well, and I, and I know this because I help. I, I he helped me. Uh, the two of us worked together on something a while ago where we shared something via his newsletter. Um, Fozzie's very good at, uh, you know, there's this model of self-publishing and marketing where they tell you to, you know, have co regular communications with people via an email newsletter. And this is something I I just don't do. Uh, Fozzie's very good at it. And um, that's, uh, well, I, I know why I wanted to bring that up because I wanted to, give you the chance to tell people how they can get in touch with you, how they can either join your newsletter, find you on Twitter. Uh, what's your preferred method for people to learn more about Fozzie? Um, well, there's, there's the usual social media stuff. Um, uh, there's, uh, you can find me on Twitter, obviously. Um, I have a Facebook page, uh, Google plus, uh, I kind of limit it to those three. I, I find if there's anything more than that, then I just struggle to keep up with it all. And there's obviously my website as well, which is uh, keithfoskett.com. Um, and if you subscribe on there, then uh, as you just mentioned, Gary, you, you get a few little teasers like uh, the first two chapters of my books. All of my books are free, so you can kind of get a taste of my writing before you you part with your cash. And... Um, there's a series of emails that I've set up uh, and I try not to sort of like, you know, suddenly start inundating everybody's mailbox with, uh, with emails every day. So I only send out once one every couple of weeks and I try to make it a little bit interesting. As you know, one of them um, was about your book. Where's the next shelter about your AT hike. Um, and that's a classic example. Um, people can sort of read the first couple of chapters of that book. Uh, I remember I, I set one up a few weeks ago, which is proving quite popular. And that's, that was just entitled um, the best three hiking movies ever. Um, and I think there's about eight or nine movies on there uh, from the likes of Scott Harriet and other people. Hey, we know that guy. Uh, yeah, each one I try yeah and... we know him. Yeah, we know Scotch. Um, so I just make each one a little bit sort of different, you know, instead of like, hey, I'm fuzzy, buy another one of my books. I, I try and sort of... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, make it sound interesting and give them something decent to read you know mm -hmm. cool well i and we're up at the uh end of our time scheduled there was one more question i wanted to ask if you don't mind uh it should only mm. take about two minutes but i wanted to ask about a detail from your hike that came up and came up an awful lot in your descriptions and you talk about staying at a help me if, if i'm saying this correctly a, is it a bothy or a bothy that's bizarre. That again came up in an email today. <laughs> um, what was the other thing that came up in an email today? The double decker. That's right. Um, that's it. Yeah, Bothy, um, Bothy, which is spelled B O B O T H Y. Bothy, we'd say. 
Um, these are usually found up in Scotland. I forget the numbers up there, but um, let's say for argument's sake, there's about 120 of these buildings up in Scotland. There's a handful in England. There's a handful in Wales as well. Um, but as I understand it, uh, generally they used to be old agricultural buildings in particular used by farmers that uh, used to take care of their livestock. So, for example, in the winter, uh, when the weather wasn't so good, uh, the farmers used to go up and they used to, sh they used to stay at these bothies uh, as opposed to making long journeys through bad weather. They used to stay up in the hills with their flocks or their herds so they can be with them and look after them now. Uh, in recent sort of years with the advent of uh, four-wheel drives and quad bikes and all that sort of things they don't need to do it anymore so a lot of these buildings fell into disrepair and there's an organization in the UK called the um, the Bothy Association which uh, basically kind of converts them or certainly looks after them they're a charity they, they they rely on donations but they'll go out and you know if one of these Bothy needs a new roof they'll go out and put a new roof on it or uh, put a new window in and they're essentially very simple buildings imagine a four-walled stone building with a uh, tin or a slate roof and you kind of walk in one door in the front and all there is is a fireplace and a bare wooden four floor and four, four stone walls there's no electric there's there's no running water there's certainly no telephone line or, or wi-fi or anything like that and they're there solely to um, give people shelter overnight in in inclement in weather, or even in the middle of the summer when it's you know it's it's not bad weather. A lot of people still still say that stay there, and uh, they're great. I love the things. There's a lot of people make make it a point to try and visit every single one, and I've stayed in a, in a few of them. And uh, there's something very. Don't know, very pleasing about staying in a building overnight where you don't have to pay for it, I guess. But <laughs> yeah. uh, they're just great. They're just, I just love them. It's you have to stay in one to uh, to understand what I'm talking about. It's 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 quite a hard thing to explain, but um, they're wonderful things. I'm really glad we have them. And this is where you stayed for most of your hike, and you met so many interesting people. You I remember you met someone who was a chef, and they brought some meat, and you cooked it in the fireplace, and you guys caught some fish in the morning, and it just it sounds positively lovely. And I I felt like yeah. I was right there with you. It it was just it was yeah. wonderful. And you can read more about the Bothies and the canals and the rights of way in Keith's new book, High and Low, which is out March fifteenth. Keith, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a, this has been thank a lot you. of fun. Thanks for asking me. It's been very really great, great talking to all of you. It's uh, uh, it's half past one now, and I'm not even tired. Um, too much coffee. <laughs> well, you've but, been... you know, I had a great time. Thank you very much. It's because you've been chugging maple syrup this whole time. <laughs> yeah, you got a little bit of a sugar rush along with yeah, it. Yeah, I, I need to go back and get some more of that stuff. I'm running out. Just be sure to chase it with a double decker. <laughs> <laughs> Stories from the Trail is a production of the Trek.co. Zach Davis, editor in chief. Your hosts are Gary Sizer and Megan Thompson. Music by Lee Rosevere. The show is recorded, mixed, and edited by me, Gary Sizer, here at Blanket Fort Studios, which is just me in my basement with a blanket over my head. Thanks for listening.